I feel like what have I done wrong, you know? A Vancouver woman hasn't seen her son for a year and a half after her husband took their five-year-old to Taiwan and decided he won't be coming back. A targeted COVID-19 vaccination clinic is opening Saturday in Vancouver to get shots in the arms of people 30 and older who live in one of eight high-transmission neighborhoods. Just ahead, who's eligible and how to sign up. Since the beginning of the pandemic, have you been getting out more into nature? Or perhaps picking up a couple of outdoor hobbies, maybe spending more time in your yard? Well, is all this outdoor time responsible for a big spike in the number of birds requiring rescue? I feel like I'm a person who can handle a lot already. Like, I've been through so much, but this is just not right. A Vancouver woman is terrified she may lose the right to her child after her husband took their five-year-old son to his home country of Taiwan and is refusing to come back. And a warning, the images in this story are graphic. Right now, I feel like no one, no one can tell me, like, what to do. <laughs> like, what's the best I could, what's the best thing to do? Like, every lawyer says different things. <laughs> Jane C. has been desperately trying to figure out her options after the father of her child brought him to Taiwan last year for a family trip. But he has now sent her papers asking for a divorce and to change their son's citizenship. Can't just, oh, yeah, like, use COVID as a reason to, like, you know, keep someone, like, it's, it's extraordinary circumstances. C says she endured years of abuse at the hands of her husband. He faced an assault charge for an alleged attack on her in 2015, but that charge was stayed at her request. Today, C's focus remains on finding a way to get her son home. I just keep thinking like, oh my God, like if my child stays in Taiwan, like what is he going to become? The left behind parent or the, the parent that is here in Canada whose kid has been taken or held um, in that foreign country. It was in a very sticky position. There's not much that can actually be done. These circumstances are not unique. Surrey lawyer Chris Carta specializes in family law. He says it comes down to whether the country has agreed to an international treaty, which helps parents get their child back when they have been abducted by a parent from one country to another. A lot of countries out there are members of something called the Hague Convention on the civil aspects of international child abduction. Canada is one of them. That creates a process for people to get their kids back to their habitual residences. Uh, in the case we're talking about, uh, Taiwan, unfortunately, is not a signatory. Without Taiwan being part of the agreement, Carta says Tsi is left with very few options, other than hiring local lawyers in Taiwan and fighting for her parental rights in that country. My Taiwanese lawyers are saying, the longer my son lives in Taiwan, the less chance I can get him back. Which, to me, it doesn't change the fact that right before this incident, his habitual residence is Canada. Angela McDougall with the Battered Women's Support Society says they've had to adapt their services to accommodate for women in circumstances like C's. See it routinely and, uh, enough where we you know, feel like we have some, some kind of expertise in the relationship between immigration, family law, and gender-based violence. And so it's a piece of work that that we've um, that we that we fell into out of necessity. C is looking at every avenue to try and get her son back. She's reached out to her local MP, support services, and now the media. But the process is beginning to make her feel hopeless. If this this is happening so much, why do we feel so hopeless when it does happen? She's been left with very few answers and is continuing to use what little money she has left to try and fight for her parental rights. This is just not right. Like. I feel like, what have I done wrong, you know? Ashley Burr, City News. A vigil is just getting underway in Delta tonight for the provincial corrections officer who was gunned down outside a mall last weekend. Family, friends and co-workers of Bikram Randawa are gathering near the Walmart on 72nd Avenue and Scott Road. City News is at the vigil live tonight where you can see a photo of Randawa is on display and flowers have been laid for him. Currently, there's more than 100 people already there. The 29-year-old was shot and killed in broad daylight last Saturday outside Scottsdale Centre. Delta police are still working to figure out who killed him and why. Investigators admit the shooting has the markings of a targeted gang hit. Friends, family and members of the community are showing up to pay their respects. We spoke with Randawa's brother just a short time ago. 
I have no words to say why this thing happened and why he's not here anymore. I would just pray to God, like whatever happened to my brother, will not will not ever happen to anybody else in the community. That's what I can pray right now. You know, this isn't the the final solution for all young people across BC in terms of their mental health needs. Kids are in need of mental health resources more than ever. And now the province has launched a free app in an effort to provide support. But some experts say even though it's a good step, it won't entirely solve the problem. 722 people have tested positive for COVID-19 in BC in the last 24 hours, and seven more people have died. 455 are currently in hospital, and 157 are in intensive care. Well over 2 million doses of vaccine have now been dispensed across the province, and 45% of all eligible British Columbians have received at least one dose. Today, anyone 49 and older can book their vaccine. Fraser Health set up an immunization clinic at a Gurdwara in Surrey this afternoon. About 400 eligible people in high transmission communities were able to pre-book their appointments at a targeted registration event at the Gurdwara last week. I think that coming into a place of worship, it's always nice, you feel comfortable, you know who to reach out to uh, in case you don't know how to do something. And today we have kind of strategized to bring a lot of uh, clerks and nurses along with us. I can speak Punjabi. Last week when we were here, we made almost 400 appointments to people that didn't know how to register, didn't have access to a phone or a computer. So we gave them appointment times because a lot of the older population don't know how to use computers or um, phone or don't have phones on them so they feel more comfortable having a piece of paper appointment time and then they come back today to get their vaccine. We really have find that having people pre-booked just gives a better experience for people. Uh, it spaces the crowd out. People know where it is and we can plan ahead make sure we've got enough vaccine for everyone. A drive through vaccination clinic is planned at another Gurdwara in Surrey on Sunday. Our province's top doctors say more detailed COVID-19 stats will be provided to the public, but there are still questions on what exactly will be handed. Those medical leaders still insist there's a legitimate reason for the withholding of certain details. It's a balancing act in the view of Dr. Bonnie Henry, an immediate call in the wake of a Vancouver Sun report showing the BC CDC has access to far more detailed virus information than we get. The provincial health officer insists there are reasons why we don't get the full picture. People always want more unless you're the one that's, that's potentially at risk. And so we do have to find that balance. That's part of our job in public health. Still, Henry's deputy, Dr. Rekha Gustafson, says the intention is to provide more info in some form given high case counts reduce concerns about individuals being identified. For City News, I'm News 1130's Martin McMahon. Canada is not uh, interfering or blocking. While America says it's time to start waiving patents on COVID vaccines, Justin Trudeau can't say if he agrees. Eight high transmission neighborhoods in Vancouver have been added to the growing list of neighborhoods across the Lower Mainland where anyone aged 30 and up is currently eligible for a COVID-19 vaccine. Vancouver Coastal Health announcing a vaccination clinic will be opening here at Killarney Community Centre on Saturday to accommodate these appointments. The high transmission neighborhoods are Cedar Cottage, Grandview Woodland, Hastings Sunrise, Kensington, Killarney, Renfrew Collingwood, Sunset and Victoria Fraser View. This clinic will will require an appointment, unlike last week's pop-up clinics in the Fraser Health region that led to long lines and confusion as people scrambled to get a spot. Residents in Vancouver's high transmission neighbourhoods are encouraged to register to receive a link to book their vaccine appointment. You can also enter your postal code on the BC government website to ensure you are eligible. This app that we're launching today will give youth, especially those living in rural and remote areas of our province, the chance to seek and receive help and services 
on demand. I just think, you know, there's some real benefits and this is really fantastic. And yet, you know, this isn't the, the final solution for all young people across BC in terms of their mental health needs. COVID-19 has hit everyone's mental health and it's been particularly hard on young people. Now the province has launched a mental health app offering on the spot continuous access to counselors, health practitioners and peer supports for kids and youth. However, some experts worry there are significant limitations with digital tools like these. From mental health care Care, substance use services, primary and sexual health care, youth and family, peer support and social services. The app called Foundry BC is available to those aged 12 to 24 free of charge. It covers an array of topics and resources to support mental health in youth. Sarah Blackmore is a clinical counselor with Peak Resilience in Vancouver. She says digital access is great but worries young people may find it difficult to access the same counselor on a regular basis. Continuity of care it sounds like to me is, is quite a big limitation. And I think we have to think about the relationship is the most important piece of counseling and mental health support. It's actually the number one predictor of client success, the relationship that you have with your mental health practitioner. Blackmore also points out that some young people don't have easy access to internet or a phone of their own. What we've heard from students um, doing schoolwork from home that sometimes there are simply not enough devices for um, a young person to have of private, secure, safe access. Dr. Shelley Emil is a professor at the University of British Columbia who studies child and social development. She's happy to see the investment in mental health and believes the biggest hurdle in the past to get kids to use these resources is often the time it takes to talk to a real person. So one of my colleagues tried to do it. She went she spent 26 different phone calls before she could actually get to somebody. Now that's ridiculous and that was a few years ago, but the point is kids will not put up with that. So you need some immediate access. Since the soft launch of the Foundry BC app in March, almost 1,100 youth, families and caregivers have registered. Blackmore emphasizes the app is a great start, but when it comes to mental health, there's no one size fits all. I think we also know that there's no substitute for in-person um, mental health support and care. In New Westminster, Ashley Burr, City News. 2,000 new jobs are coming to the Lower Mainland this year as part of Amazon's latest expansion. It's opening five new facilities locally, including a robotics fulfillment centre at the Port of Vancouver, which will employ 1,000 people. New sites are also planned for Langley, Pitt Meadows and Delta. Amazon's popular Prime Day sale has been put on pause across Canada this year due to COVID-19 outbreaks at facilities in the Greater Toronto Area. Public health officials have ordered the partial closure of three separate Amazon fulfillment facilities in recent weeks. The company says it's continuing to monitor the situation. And at this point, it's not clear if the Prime Day event will be pushed to later this year. Spring is extra busy this year. We're up 74% than we were last year. And last year we were up as well. The Wildlife Rescue Association of BC is swamped right now. For the second spring in a row, it's seeing huge increases in the number of birds needing help. Janelle Stevenson is the rescue's hospital manager. She says baby birds in distress aren't new for the springtime, but at the rate they're coming in, it's getting harder to keep up. Our resources are definitely stretched. Janelle tells us one potential reason for the sharp increase in the number of birds that require rescue could be the pandemic. With much more people out working in their yard, taking up an outdoor hobby or simply spending time in nature, the odds of an interaction with an animal go up. Generally, where more people congregate, there's more interaction with wildlife and then we do see a spike of animals coming from that area that normally wouldn't because there's a higher number of people using the outdoor area. Cassandra has been helping to care for the birds who come in. She's giving us a look at how it's done. So we have hummingbirds, robins, um, as well as European starlings, some juncos. One of the things about being in here is we're trying to keep our voices down so the birds don't get too used to people's voices. Also, there's this really retro CD player that just keeps playing bird calls. This here's the food. Yes. What's inside it? So this is our baby food. Um, it's made from a base of um, cat kibble, basically. So we put the cat kibble in water, and then it gets mushed up, and then we add probiotics and other vitamins that the babies need. That's 
an Anna's hummingbird. This one is starting to self feed. Hummingbirds are, they're, they got, they got my favorite probably, but robins are very adorable too. Um, they're very cute. You can just like hold them in your hand and they'll sit there and just kind of just stare at you. They're just sweethearts. Uh, you just described that bird as a sweetheart. Yeah. Do, they, do you find they have personalities? Oh, 100%. Especially different species will have different personalities. Each bird, of course, comes in with a very different story. Oh, so this bird was actually found in a garbage can earlier today. At the same time, Janelle tells us there are some things we can do to help. She says donations are appreciated, but most importantly, watching out so baby birds don't need to come in in the first place. Looking before you do any yard work, construction, anything out on your property where there could be nesting animals. She says if you think an animal is in distress, give it space, take photos and video, and call the Wildlife Rescue to see what to do next. In Burnaby, David Zura, City News. I know that this is not a politically easy thing to do. So I very much appreciate the leadership of the United States and we urge other countries to follow their example. The United States winning international praise after backing a push to waive intellectual property rights for COVID vaccines. The move would clear the way for less developed nations to start making more vaccines, but Justin Trudeau can't say if that's something Canada would support. We are engaged wholeheartedly in these discussions uh, on various proposals. Uh, we know uh, that we need to work together as a world to get to the right place. Trudeau previously said he was waiting for allies to weigh in, but while the U.S. supports waiving patent protection, France and Germany don't. South Africa and India say they could start making more vaccines if the rules change, but not if pharma companies can sue for patent infringement. The World Trade Organization provisions for IP waivers were designed precisely for a situation like this. If we don't use them now, then when? I'm having conversations with colleagues in Brazil and I'm having conversations with colleagues in India right now about the, the way that variants there are really devastating lives and communities. CM Real with Oxfam Canada says proposals to waive IP aren't intended to last forever, just until the pandemic ends. And Canada insisting on a consensus agreement just delays when negotiations on waivers can start. Canada is saying uh, right now that, you know, we want to act as mediators on, on for different sides on this issue is not getting at the core problem, which is the fact that this waiver and, and those that are opposed to it um, are, are getting in the way of, of, of ensuring that vaccine supplies uh, can be rapidly scaled up. I can assure you that Canada is not uh, interfering or blocking. Canada is very much working to find a solution that works for everyone. In Ottawa, Shaoli Lee, City News. And a vigil is underway in Delta for a provincial corrections officer who was gunned down outside a mall last weekend. Family, friends and co-workers of Bikram Randawa are gathering near the Walmart on 72nd Avenue and Scott Road. The 29-year-old was shot and killed last Saturday outside Scottsdale Centre. Delta police are still working to figure out who killed him and why. A large crowd has gathered over the last hour with friends, family and members of the community paying their respects. City News will be back tonight at 11. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.